We care about lots of things. We woke up today caring about our favorite sport teams and our vacation coming up and our deadline, our friends, our family, the leaky roof. We don't care about your new brand of shampoo. It's just not something that's important to us. That ultimately is, I think, the biggest failing of a lot of communicators. We think that it, what's important to us is inherently just as important to the receiver. Helping you create loyal customers and loyal employees all through the power of simplicity. This is the Simple Brand Podcast, now heard around the world, including Alpharetta, Georgia. I'm your host, Matt Lyles, and this week, I'm talking with Ben Gutman. Ben's a marketing and communications expert who's on a mission to get leaders to more effectively connect by simplifying their message. He's the former co-founder and managing partner at Digital Natives Group, where they help shape brands like the NFL, I Love New York, and Comcast NBC Universal. Today, he teaches digital marketing at Baruch College in New York and is a sought-after marketing consultant. And Ben's the best-selling author of Simply Put, Why Clear Messages Win and How to Design Them. Listen, no matter if you're crafting messages in your customer experience, communicating to your leadership or your employees, or even if you're just trying to tell your kids to clean up their rooms, simplicity in communication is crucial. Now, I think it's pretty safe to say that we all value simplicity when we receive it. I mean, with all the complex experiences and messages being thrown at us every day, it's refreshing when we experience simplicity. But as much as we value it, I think it's hard to actually deliver it, especially when we're trying to communicate something important. And unfortunately, it's not as simple as saying, oh yeah, just keep it simple. I can do that. Done and done. You've likely heard me say this before. Simple is not easy. Whether it's your customer experience or just your messaging, it's actually pretty hard to make it simple. It takes a lot of effort to create an experience that makes it effortless for your audience. And when it comes to communication, it turns out there are some specific principles you need to follow if you want to ensure your message is both simple enough to break through all the noise out there and simple enough for your audience to actually grasp it. Ben and I discuss those principles along with some of the things that tend to make messages complex and how you can ensure you don't let those things happen to your message. So here it is. Here's my interview with Ben Gutman. Hey, Ben. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Matt. It's great to be here. Yeah, well, I'm happy that you're here. I feel like we are kindred spirits, you know, with our focus on simplicity. So congrats, congrats on releasing Simply Put. I'm curious, I'd like to know, with all your preparation, your reason behind writing and crafting the book, what got us to this point where we even need to be having this conversation around simplifying our message? So my background is I, I ran a marketing agency for 10 years. I uh, sold yeah. that about two years ago. Uh, I've also taught now. I teach at Baruch College in New York. I've done that for about 10 years. Uh, and the same question would come up in both the boardroom and the classroom. Uh, and also, by the way, as just a consumer, as a voter, as a user of the world, right? We see the same thing, which is there are people who have incredible things that they want to share big ideas that are going to change the world, big products, big companies, the movements they want to run, but they have a really hard time getting it across. And so the question that really drives a lot of marketing is trying to figure out how do you get something from my head to the head of my audience? How do you get something, you transmit something across that void? And that boils down to why do some messages work and others don't? And that's the kind of question that ended up animating yeah. The entire book is something that you hire a marketing agency to do, something you're, when you're taking a class on it, you're trying to learn how to do. But frankly, when I was in the thick of it, in terms of running a business, it's really hard to answer that question. You kind of know what you're doing, the muscle memory and stuff. But until you were able to step away from it for a little bit, and I really kind of dig into it, look at the research, hard to really figure out what is the answer to that question. So why are so many messages not breaking through? 
what it comes down to is if we look at the communications equation, right? We have strip away all these other things. We, we always get stuff in the way in terms of, well, I'm this and this group is that. There are senders and there are receivers. So senders, okay. we have advertisers, we have executives, entrepreneurs, advocates, parents, teachers. All of those groups are in the sender hat. The receivers are the buyers, the voters, the donors, the people that you're trying to communicate to. And listen, we're both of them all the time, right? Yeah. We go back and forth from this. But if you're looking at that atomic element of communication, we're trying to get a message across from the sender to the receiver. Now, that's not particularly revolutionary. But what's interesting is when you look at how we behave in both of those roles, the science really points to the fact that we are pulled in opposite directions. So receivers, which are really the most important part of the equation, right? It's not successful unless they receive and get and do something with the message. Receivers want something known as fluency. And so we know the word fluency, right? Like we can be fluent in English or Spanish or Mandarin. Uh, but when you look at it from a cognitive science perspective, you ask somebody wearing one of those lab coats, they're going to say fluency described, how easy is it? for you to take something from out in the world, stick it in your head and make sense of it. The easier that is, the less mental work you have to do to get something from out in the world into your head and make sense of it. Well, the more you like it, the more you trust it, and the more you buy it. All the things that you really want when you're in a position of communicating. You want people to internalize and take action on your message. And that is all associated, all the science points in the same direction with something being fluent. Uh, so that's where receivers want to be, or want the message to be. The problem is, and this is where everything falls apart, is that the senders are pulled in the opposite direction. When we are senders, we are pulled towards complicated because of internal forces and external forces, right? So internally, we have this bias towards addition, bias towards complexity. Externally, there's all sorts of forces pushing there from our bosses, the media cycle, how many things you want to put on your resume, social media, all these things that pull us in the direction of more and of more complicated. And so that is the gulf. That's what we're trying to figure out is how do we get something from a sender to receiver? But the problem is receivers are over here, senders are way over there. Something you said a moment ago, what really st stuck out with me is the fact that in this equation, the receiver is the most important part of the equation. When we are in the role of the sender, I think a lot of times senders assume that they, or at least their message, is the most important part of that equation. Oh, yeah. Ultimately, the failing of a lot of communicators is that we think that everybody cares as much as we do about the thing that we're trying to tell people. Yeah. That everybody well, understands. Yeah. We think everybody understands everything that we do. We they understand the same words and the same jargon and acronyms. We think that everybody has the same motivations. Everybody has the same general opinions as we do. We think that everybody is making time to pay attention and analyze every part of the message that you do. When in reality, all you have to do is think about your own daily life. How many messages did you see today? Did you hear today? Things that you sought out, maybe you read an article somewhere, scrolled to Twitter or whatever it was. And things that sought you out in terms of advertisements and car horns and uh, signs on the street. How many of those things do you remember? A yeah. vanishingly small amount. We care about lots of things. We woke up today caring about our favorite sport teams and our vacation coming up and our deadline, yeah. our friends, our family, the leaky roof. We don't care about your new brand of shampoo. It's just not something that's important to us. That ultimately is, I think, the biggest failing of a lot of communicators. So we think that it, what's important to us is inherently just as important to the receiver. Yeah. In that regards, I like to equate that or tie that very closely to what Chip and Dan Heath refer to as the curse of knowledge, assuming and thinking that everyone knows all that you know or assuming and thinking that everyone cares about all that you care about, when really they don't. Oh, that's 100% the, the case. When you look at that from an empathy perspective, this is what you call like the, the false consensus effect, the kind of underlying science is that, is I might think that I'm a pretty normal guy 
and mint chip is my favorite flavor of ice cream. So therefore, yeah. everybody else probably likes mint chip. And if you Why do not? this type of survey of a lot of different things, people are going to go out and they're going to say, hey, I like chocolate. Everybody probably likes chocolate, right? And in reality, the, the population, some people might like mint chip or they might like chocolate. Might be a lot of people like vanilla, or strawberry, or cookie dough, or something else. We are very bad about extrapolating our own experience into saying, well, this is the norm. This is what everybody is. And that ends up with us saying, well, everybody understands the words that I'm saying. Everybody understands this set of acronyms or this technical uh, jargon. Therefore, everybody's going to get what I'm saying. But in reality, the gulf is really, really big. Yeah, it is. And a lot of it comes down to, well, like one, one of the things you talk about is empathy, is putting yourself in your receiver's shoes, in your receiver's mindset and thinking like them and realizing, oh, here's the language that they use. Here's the way that they go about thinking about things. So therefore, that's what I need to use in order to break through all the clutter, all those other messages that they're being bombarded with. A hundred percent. Yeah. I like to kind of ask people sometimes, like, what do you think the average uh, reading uh, comprehension level is uh, in the United States. And they say, well, you know, it's probably high school or something like that. It, yeah. It's closer to sixth grade. And yeah. um, when you look at the the chunk of, of people who are functionally illiterate, according to the U.S. Department of Education, it's a very large chunk. I don't have the number right in front of me, but it's something like 20% or so. Um, oh, wow. There's lots of kind of indictments there about kind of our education and investment. But beyond that, what we are trying to figure out is how can we speak in a way that everybody kind of gets? Uh, the, the best open rates on email subject lines, they come in around second or third grade reading level. Even if we think that we are so smart and that we have all these words at our disposal, we have a shared base of understanding, but then we have this kind of long tail that goes out in a lot of different directions about maybe I'm in marketing and I know all the different marketing buzzwords, right? Maybe I'm an engineer yeah. and all the engineer buzzwords, but is your customer, is your audience in the same space? So there's a tool that I like to recommend, which is to look at the thousand most common words as a kind of baseline. The, the okay. way that uh, English is distributed uh, in most of the languages actually is it's along a pattern, uh, we're highly concentrated. The first word is used about twice as much as the, the second word, about third times as much as the, as the third word. Um, and this basically works out to being that the top 100 most commonly used words represent about 50% of English as it's used. The top 1,000 most commonly used words represent about 75% of English as it's used. So if we wanted to get to a point where we say, how can we talk to the largest group possible? Well, if we use this as a way to stress test our message. We take our blog post or email, we can look at it and uh, there's tools online. I actually built one uh, where you can kind of drop in that text, click a button, and it will highlight in red all the words that are not part of the thousand most commonly used words. And that doesn't mean you have to get rid of all of them. But it gives you a sense as to saying, okay, where might be the points of failure here where somebody might have a hard time understanding it? And by the way, this is a tool I've seen a few folks use with ChatGPT. I've spoken to yeah. a few folks who have read my book and then they take their blog post, they drop it into ChatGPT and they say, hey, can you rewrite this using the thousand most commonly used words plus 20 extra words? And using that kind of short lease there to say, okay, yeah. there are be some bits of color or jargon that are going to make it more accurate, but this will be a much better output than just kind of assuming that we have, everybody has the same level of technical knowledge that we do. Right. Well, have they shared what those results have been from chat GPT? I haven't read their blog posts necessarily that have come out of that, but I know they've been very satisfied with it. I will say okay. one thing that's been interesting is another friend took, uh, he's an author and has a podcast also. He took his newsletter and he ran the content through ChatGPT and basically trained that model against my book. And he said, yeah. okay, well, take this email and make it simply put, basically. He did an A-B test on this. Turns out that the simply put version had 40% better click rate than the uh, original version did. And that's this unscientific sample, but of I course. was very happy to see that number and been able to wave it around a little bit. That just helps make 
the case for simplicity, like why simplicity matters. So one of the things you were talking about earlier was making things complicated. This stood out to me in your book because you make the distinction in your book between complicated and complex. I got to say, all this time, I've been making the mistake of using those two terms interchangeably. So what's the distinction? What's the difference between complicated and complex? Mm -hmm. So the way I look at this, the way I try to define those two terms is saying that there's a spectrum between simple and complicated, sorry, simple and complex. Okay. Uh, it's easy to get them confused. Uh, complex means that it has a lot of different parts, very intricate interactions. There are things that are complex in the world. It's a benign state of things for it to be complex. International diplomacy is complex. The human yeah. eye is complex. Semiconductors are complex. These things yeah. are complex. There's a lot of nuance in them. There's nothing wrong with complexity. My indictment is against complicated. Complicated is when something could be simple, but we didn't do the work of getting it there. We let the biases and the forces that are pulling us towards more and more difficult to win. And that we don't really put up with. We will read, we will seek things out that are complex. We will learn difficult music on the piano or read War and Peace, but we won't put the same energy and motivation into the really bad like furniture assembly instructions that we got. We won't do that with the badly written PTO memo. That causes us this kind of stress and this pain because it is unfinished. Because yeah. it could be something that simple. We didn't do the job of, of pulling it there. So correct me if this is not the right analogy. Google's search engine, Google's homepage, there's a lot of complexity that goes into the search engine. There's a lot of complexity that goes into the algorithm and everything behind it. But for the receiver or for the user, it's not complicated. That's not a complicated experience. Oh, yeah. And actually, so Marissa Meyer, who was a Google executive, later went on to run Yahoo and, and right. a few other companies. In the kind of early days, the heyday of Google, when you were looking at this very simple page that represents a very complex backend, uh, she said something along the lines of Google has the functionality of a really complicated Swiss army knife, but the home page is our way of approaching it closed. You're only kind of no. seeing the parts that are important there. Uh, she says that, you know, it's simple, it's elegant, you can slip it in your pocket, but it's got the great doodad when you need it. A lot of our competitors are like a Swiss army knife open. And that could be intimidating and occasionally harmful. And I love that, uh, that thinking behind it, which is there can be a lot of intricate stuff behind there, but how do you distill it in a way that the interaction point where the hardware and the software hits the humans, how do we make that something that's simple and that's elegant and that's easy to use? That's partially messaging we're talking about. It's parts, a lot of it's also usability and user experience yeah. design. I think that there's a continuum. I think kind of one of the foundational arguments in this book is that this is a user experience take on messaging more than it is really anything else. That is. And that's something that you talk about as well is taking a design approach to crafting your message. Yeah. And that's my background. My background is in design. I've done lots yeah. of user experience design. I've done graphic design. I tried to take that framework that mindset and bring that into this realm, we're talking about what is the experience of interacting with a message. And, and to that end, there is, we've talked about a few of them in the last couple of minutes here, but the way which we bridge that gap I talked about earlier in the conversation between where we are as senders and receivers, right. I've identified five design principles that we can use to get there. And so we talked about empathy before, that's one of them. Yeah. Um, but when we're talking about empathy, that is, are you speaking in the language that the audience understands? That's a, an important piece. But beyond empathy, we'll talk about benefits. Is it beneficial? What does it matter to the receiver? What's in it for them? Right. You know, sales 101 stuff, right? Features versus benefits. Focused is the next one. Are you trying to say one thing or multiple things at once? Is it one idea or is it three ideas in a trench coat? That salient yeah. is the next one. Does it stand out from the noise? Is it noticeable? Does it rise to your attention? Is there a contrast between the message and the background? 
And then finally, it was minimal. Have you cut out everything that isn't important and left only what is? Have you cut out all the noise, all the points of friction, and left something that is simple and fluent at the end of that process? And by the way, when we're talking about minimal, we are not talking about the fewest number of words or paragraphs or pages, but the least amount of friction. That's an important distinction. Right. Taking it down to what is needed to provide the right message and the right experience to that receiver, right? Kind of like using Jenga to be able to do that. Like how many pieces can you pull out before it falls down? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I've used that as kind of an analogy here, which is everything that you have that is not necessarily needed. It could be a word or it could be a type of word or it could be the formatting. All of these things contribute to the friction and every bump of friction is an opportunity to take an off ramp. Imagine that you're on the highway here and you're trying to go from point A to point B from the center of the receiver. Well, every time there's a little bump in the road, every time your brain has to work a little bit harder yeah. understanding what somebody's trying to get you to understand, well, you say, you know what, maybe I'm just going to go back to Instagram, right? <laughs> maybe I'm just going to go back and pay my attention to one of the thousand other things that are competing for us at the moment. And so every little bit there is a problem. You mentioned the Jenga bit. There's another tool you can use similar to the thousand most common words, yeah. which has helped you establish a baseline. Another way to get to that is to start at the top. Start with your message as you wrote, start with your, start with your email and pull out words or sections or sentences until it doesn't make sense anymore. And once you right. hit that point, once the context collapses from it, you understand, okay, well, go back one step and you feel like that's the minimum viable message, right? That's the part that makes sense at the smallest level. It might be more fluent and it might be more effective to add another couple things back in. That's not saying you have to be just there at that bottom part, but that'll help you establish saying, okay, well, this is where I can't go below before someone is going to break and it's not going to make any sense. That tool is a very easy one to be able to you know, slap something up on a screen, start deleting things, highlight in red, whatever you got to do. Nice. And to me, like that speaks to the value of subtracting versus adding. It's like, what's the main message? And then can we add more? Can we add more? Can we add more? Can we add more? That actually kind of goes back to one of your other principles, I think, around being focused. And you talk about an issue. I, I had not heard it described this way before, but like I was reading it was like, that's it. And I've been in that situation time and time again with so many different leaders and executives, especially if you're in a cross-functional setting where everybody needs to make sure that their organization, that their team gets to share or include their message and their piece in there. And it ends up creating, um, well, it ends up creating a monster. Oh yeah. I think you're alluding to what I subtitled the focus chapter, which is fighting the Frankenstein idea. Right. The Frankenstein so, idea. <laughs> Frankenstein. If you read the original book, you look at yeah. how Mary Shelley describes the monster. It is not describing it as everything is terrible. In fact, right. how she writes about it is saying every individual piece was chosen for its beauty. It was chosen to the lustrous black hair and burly white eyes and strong muscles and this and that. Uh, but when you put them together, it forms this horrid contrast. It becomes worse than the sum of its parts. This is something I see, especially I see anywhere there's a flat organization, but I see it in the classroom as the most uh, jarring example of this. Because when I teach my class and I have okay. my students, it's inherently a flat organization. They don't, I break right. them up yeah. into groups. They could elect a leader in the group. We don't make them. They can choose however they want to organize it. But when they have their projects that they do when I give them an assignment and say, here's a brand, go make a pitch for this brand. And I bring in some judges to evaluate it. As we're sitting there listening to the final presentations, a bunch of them are going to be awesome, but at least one every semester is going to come in and it's the Frankenstein idea. It is, well, we're going to use this hashtag and that hashtag and this influencer and that influencer. We're going to have a website and a mobile app and we're going to have this thing of AI and this thing occurred. And it's a bunch of ideas that were taken. They wrapped some string around them and said, here you go. If one idea is good, two ideas is better, right? Of course. And seven ideas is even better than that. So you throw everything together, hope that something sticks. 
The problem with this is that the way we respond to things in terms of arguments or, you know, somebody's making a case for something is that we don't add them. As the receiver, we don't add arguments. If somebody says, well, this person is really good for X for reason, this product is really good for reasons A and B and C. We don't say, well, A is the big reason, but B is okay a little bit and C is okay a little bit. And so we'll add yeah. them on top. So it's even better. What we do is we average them. This is known as the dilution effect. We yeah. average the arguments. We say, well, it's the A is a really great argument. B is not so great of an argument. C is kind of weak. And so all of a sudden we go, well, maybe it's somewhere in the middle, right? Like the first yeah. one might've been a fluke that, you know, these other ones are there. Uh, and, and that is really why this is so nasty of a trap that we fall into with the Frankenstein uh, idea is because one thing that is even mediocre, but fully committed to is often way more effective in terms of if it's an ad campaign or if it's your email to your boss, uh, you know, are you going for more PTO? Um, all of those things are better when you're committing to one big idea than here's the kitchen sink. Yeah. When you keep throwing in more and more and throwing in the kitchen sink, it, it seems like it's a situation where the whole is less than the sum. Yeah. Which is even and worse than like what you would think if you just put everything in there. I, I've been in situations where I've pitched work to a client and they will say, well, we kind of really hate this. Yeah. We have two options. One, some people love it and some people hate it on the team. This other one, everybody's kind of okay with it. It doesn't sound like it at the time, but when you look down the road, the first one's the right answer. It's because love and hate are a lot closer to each other than apathy and passion. Not caring about something, not having a okay. strong opinion on a logo or a slogan or, or whatever. Right. Is it's very hard to move somebody from not having an opinion on it, from not really caring about it to thinking it's great. But it's a lot easier to take somebody who says, I hate this. This is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. This is to being like, okay, this actually was great. That energy is the important part, not so much kind of which direction it's pointing in. Oh, wow. I don't think I've ever even thought about that. If anything, like one of the last feelings you want is apathy. You want to have some sort of strong feeling on it. Yeah. There's a long history of things that we look at now as being very successful or iconic or whatever that people didn't like in the beginning. And, you know, they were divisive. Red Bull, when they would do taste tests of Red Bull, people were like, this tastes like piss. This is terrible. Yeah. Now it's like the, one of the top five most uh, popular soft drinks in the world. The Eiffel Tower, when they were building it, some people loved it. Some people were like, this looks like a pile of scrap metal that they're putting up in the sky. <laughs> now it's the most popular monument in the world, most photographed tourist attraction. So like that distance is a lot shorter. And apathy, there's a lot, again, a lot of noise, big world with lots of things that want our attention. Apathy doesn't help you get anybody's attention. It's better for you to take a stand and commit to an idea, commit to one concept, one thing you're trying to say rather than dilute it with a bunch of stuff because that feels safer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You want to be able to evoke some sort of strong emotion. Cool. Well, let's, let's talk about one more principle, salience. What's the best way to ensure that you really stand out? So salience is, is are you noticeable, right? Do you stand out from the noise? I argue that the best way to get there when you're talking about a creativity standpoint, a messaging standpoint, is to play by different rules than everybody else is playing by. If you do some, if you do something in a different way that other people are, you're going to end up with a different result than what they're going to end up with. Uh, and so this is about embracing constraints. We yeah. often think of constraints as saying, oh, constraints, that means I can't do something. That means yeah. I'm not going to have the full realm of possible creative output that I could have. But in reality, it, every time you embrace constraints, it pushes you in a way to do something a little bit different, pushes you out of that rut, pushes you out of that. Literally the rut is the, where the wheel goes over and over again, right? And by doing something that jolts it, that's a jolt to the steering wheel, right? And is able to get you into new terrain, you're gonna end up with new creative, new different and salient creative output. Well, but I, I have to think when it comes to constraints, to me, it seems like it's best to consider like on being on a spectrum. 
you don't want to have like wide open, no constraints, but is there a point where you say, wow, like these constraints are actually too tight to actually produce something? Yeah. And so that, that's a great point because the science behind constraints basically points to the idea of medium constraints being the most important piece. So if okay. you don't have any constraints, if you, if I say, Matt, here is a RFP, your proposal is due next year. If you tell me it's <laughs> next year, yeah, that's not a problem for you. That's a problem for future Matt, right? That, yeah. that, that doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll start go. working on that 11 months from now, yeah. maybe. Like the too much rope, have to hang yourself type of thing, right? But with the other end of the spectrum, if I say, Matt, this proposal is due tomorrow, you're going to go, shoot, I got, I can't, I, you know, I can't get anything in for this. I'm just going to copy and paste something. Maybe ChatGPT can help me. And we figure out how to get something in under the wire, but there's not going to be a lot of creative output as part of them. But if you would do it somewhere in that middle, you say, hey, the proposal is due in five days, due in a week. And every arena, that this means something different, right? But a little bit of pressure is enough to kind of push you to do something novel, do something different. While, while we're on this, there's one last little tidbit on yeah. constraints. Constraints, we often think of them as a maximum. We think, oh, we only have this much time. I only have this many characters, this many colors I can use on something. Right. But they can also come in the form of a minimum. And this is an interesting tool to use oh. when you're trying to do something different and creative. Is let's say you have to come up with a, with a slogan. You have to come up with a hundred slogans before you can make a decision on anything. And so what happens when you do the minimum of this is that talk about that rut again, the rut's where the wheel goes over and over. You get out of that rut by going past where it ends, by going to the point where you got past the easy, obvious answers. But then once you're in that slogan 77 or whatever it is, and you're like, I'm in some weird territory now, right? And you get to this point where you get past a hundred of them, you start to be a little less precious with each one. And you start to get to a point where you say, okay, you know what? There's some really novel stuff here that I wouldn't have gotten to had I only said, I got to do 10 of these things. I haven't really thought of constraints in that way, like uh, being constrained to a minimum beyond just messaging and ideas that speaks to innovation as well. If you're familiar with Josh Linkner, he speaks a lot around innovation. And one of the tools he uses for coming up with ideas is getting to idea X instead of going with idea, you know, and, and thinking through, okay, what's idea A, B, and C and being, you know, confined to like the ruts of those first three, keep going all the way till you get to, to letter X. That's where some of your best and like you said, most novel ideas are going to come out. Well, okay, so we've talked about why simplicity is important. We've talked about some of your principles. But what about leaders who say, well, my industry, my business, my product, my audience is different. I don't want to have to dumb it down for my audience. They're too smart for that. There's certainly going to be some level of investing proportionally in terms of where the sweet spot is for your audience. And I also argue when you talk about empathy, it's all about talking to your audience, making sure that they understand the same things that, that you are understanding. You can't just talk to anybody. You gotta talk, you gotta talk to somebody that looks like your audience. Right. And if if you're targeting chiropractors, if that is your audience, uh, it doesn't matter if you speak to 400 plumbers. Four chiropractors can give you more insight than 400 plumbers are going to and vice versa. That's one big piece of this. The second one I, I would argue is even when you are in a highly technical role, in a highly technical space, we are all still humans. There's a long anecdote that I have at one point in the book. We talk about why complicated is so dangerous. Talk about the space shuttle Columbia. Right. And so just the kind of the thumbnail of this story is basically when Columbia lifted off in 2003, I believe, a small chunk of the insulating foam fell off, chipped a tile on the way down, which basically made the heat shielding disintegrate when they were re-entering and all the astronauts perished. Um, it was something that was caught on camera when they were launching the space shuttle. A small piece of phone came off, hit the side of the shuttle, and they have this investigation. Uh, Boeing is one of the contractors as part of the investigation. Uh, they come and they write this report. And it's a very technical report. Like, very quickly, this is happening in the span of a few days. 
big reams of data and of slides and buried on, and I'm going to get the numbers wrong, like the seventh page of the fourth report, the eighth bullet, there is the key piece there that actually would, if taken seriously, if made salient, would have made a difference. And it, it talked about the size and the speed at which this foam hit the side of the space shuttle. And granted, you know, you can get really into the weeds here and say, was there anything they can actually do just to, if they did abort the mission, you can get really deep into that territory. Yeah. But the idea is this was very important information, but it was buried in a very technical, really unnoticeable way. Uh, and that ended up contributing to the ultimate disaster that happened later on. So you can say, hey, I'm technical. We have this. You're not more technical than NASA is, right? You're not more technical than mission control. And they still ultimately had a challenge of communicating because something was complicated when it should have been simple. Yeah. Well, and that, that goes back to what we were talking about earlier around comprehension. So your audience may have a level of comprehension and based on how narrow your audience is, their comprehension may be higher or lower than others. But just because your audience has high comprehension doesn't mean that they automatically want to pay attention to every single technical term mm -hmm. that falls in their comprehension. Absolutely. Last question for you, Ben. If you were to create a five song soundtrack for Simply Put, what songs would you include? Oh, wow. Well, that's a good run. Let's see. The first one might just be just for the apt name, Simple Song by The Shins. I've always yeah. loved The Shins. It's a great song. I, I don't know how well the lyrics actually map onto anything here, but uh, the title works. Appropriate title for it, right? Yeah. Uh, I would say something also that the there's lyrics or lack thereof was is not really a, a match, but Rhapsody in Blue uh, by George okay. Gershwin. So the story behind that is I listened to Rhapsody in Blue and An American in Paris, the other famous Gershwin piece, pretty much back to back during a good chunk of the writing here. Because nice. have you ever heard of the Pomodoro Method? Yes. Uh, Yes. But it's basically the Pomodoro method. It's about 30 minutes together of no lyrics of kind of a driving beep for it. And it was a very helpful way to, to get, you know, to get the sentences and the paragraphs and the pages done. So. That's it. Yeah. You know, this is exactly how long it takes. This is your time. So mm -hmm. focus work just yeah. during those songs. Yeah. So those, that was, uh, that was an important piece of it. And you can do that with whatever piece of music you want. I would say, uh, so we talked about space a little bit. There's several anecdotes regarding space in the book. Yeah. Space Oddity by David Bowie, another favorite. Uh, it was it's about communicating, major time to ground right. control, right? So right. The, uh, we talk about Columbia. We talk about the Voyager probe. We talk about the Apollo missions. There's Star Trek in there too. So we do mention it a few times. <laughs> uh, and, you know, part of that's because I'm a space nerd. Second part of that is because I think that it's a great example of the most challenging types of communication in terms of most mission critical and most challenging types of communication. So great song, good little space theme. And I would say you can't always get what you want by the Rolling Stones. Right. We talked about minimal second line of that song or second line of that chorus is you get what you need. When we talk about minimal, we're talking about getting what you need across, not necessarily everything you want to put in there, but what is the most important <laughs> thing as a part of it. And then finally, I'll wrap with one of my favorite artists, Bruce Springsteen, who is mentioned in the book as yeah. we talk about the Frankenstein idea, talk about leadership and, and focus. He's the boss, right? And so I'll, go, I'll throw Born to Run in there. As, love as that. that. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, very cool. I, I love all those songs. And I appreciate you sharing part of your behind the scenes for writing the book, too. I always, always like when people share that. Well, Ben, I've learned so much from your book. I've learned so much from you. But where can people go to learn more from you? Likewise. Thanks so much, Matt. It's been a ton, uh, ton of fun chatting here. Uh, cool. If you're interested, go grab the book. Simply put, yeah. Why Clear Messages Win and How to Design Them. Available wherever books are sold. Uh, if you go to my website, bengutman.com, you need two T's and two N's in Gutman. It's, it's not very radio friendly of a name. But if you go there, uh, you can find links to the book. There is a free chapter download you can go grab. And then also, if you find your way to the resources section, you can also locate that thousand word checker that I mentioned before. So go check that out. Yes, absolutely. I'm definitely going to put the thousand word checker in the show notes as well. And I'm going to use it from now on. Well, Ben, thank you so much. It was so great having you here. Thanks so much, Matt. Have a great day. Thanks for having me. 
I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Ben Gutman. You can learn more from him at bengutman.com. And be sure to grab your copy of Simply Put. Not only will it help you ensure your ideas always break through the noise, it'll also help you ensure they resonate with your people. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it so much simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring Erica Keswin. We'll be discussing lessons from her book, The Retention Revolution, seven surprising and very human ways to keep employees connected to your company. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get Erica's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple.